Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin and U.S. President Joe Biden both delivered speeches focusing on the war in Ukraine. Their speeches came just a few hours apart. The narratives ahead of the war's one-year mark, well, they were worlds apart. In his annual State of the Nation address, Putin lashed out at Ukraine and the West with a lie, accusing them of starting the war. He also attempted to realign Russia, placing it alongside China and the developing world in a 21st century struggle to push back what he calls a decadent and aggressive West. Hours later, and hundreds of miles away in Warsaw, Poland, U.S. President Joe Biden pointed the finger at Putin, accusing him of war atrocities in Ukraine. He also called on the world to stand up to other tyrants. We have this report. Two presidents, Starve the world. two speeches, Blocking the ports of the United States. two very different visions of the war in Ukraine. As the first anniversary of Russia's invasion approaches, President Vladimir Putin showed little sign of backing down. Putin's lengthy address reiterated a long list of grievances against the West and once again framed his invasion of Ukraine as a fight for Russia's survival. The Western elites do not conceal their goals. As they say, it's a direct quote, to bring Russia a strategic defeat. What does it mean? What is it for us? It means to end us once and for all. As a State of the Nation address, much of the Russian president's speech was directed at the Russian audience. But it closed with a stark warning for the rest of the world. They want to inflict a strategic defeat on us and try to get to our nuclear facilities. In this regard, I am forced to announce today that Russia is suspending its participation in the Strategic Offensive Arms Treaty. That agreement, known as the New START Treaty, placed limits on the total number of long-range nuclear weapons that both Russia and the U.S. could have. Many fear that Russia's suspension only increases the risk of a nuclear confrontation. But in a fiery address outside Poland's royal castle in Warsaw, U.S. President Joe Biden chose not to rise to the bait. Instead, he presented a very different view of the conflict. So tonight, I speak once more to the people of Russia. The United States and the nations of Europe do not seek to control or destroy Russia. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. Just a day after his historic visit to Kyiv, Biden drove home the message that Western support for Ukraine will last as long as it takes. One year into this war, Putin no longer doubts the strength of our coalition, but he still doubts our conviction. But there should be no doubt. Our support for Ukraine will not waver. NATO will not be divided, and we will not tire. The commitment of the United States As the one-year anniversary of the invasion approaches, the conflict shows no sign of ending. And the two sides appear as far apart as ever. And for more on Putin, Biden, and the split-screen realities over Ukraine, I'm joined now by Jade McLenn. She has researched and written extensively on Russia. Her latest book, entitled Russia's War, is due out next month, I understand. She, jo she joins me tonight from Oxford. Jade, it's good to have you on the program again. Maybe you could help us understand what what we saw today when Vladimir Putin delivered his State of the Nation address, I watched and listened, and, and what struck me was a president with a long list of grievances speaking before a room of people, not a smile in the house. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were some very um, memeable faces in that audience. Um, I, I think rather than insanely tedious a lot of it i think to the average western leader would sound tediously insane um and that's really the crux of the issue that that your reporting has already has already noted which is that this address it showed once again that the russian president clearly inhabits not only a sort of different version of reality but almost a different epoch um, from from that from the sort of the west what we might problematically call the western view um, this, however, was a, a speech or an address that's not really aimed 
um, at foreign audiences, although, of course, um, yeah. he, he would have understood that foreign audiences would be one of them. Traditionally, this State of the Nation address is more for the business and political elites. You know, would you say that this speech then was completely for domestic consumption? And when I say domestic consumption, I, I'm talking about just the average Russian citizen, you know, Mr. Joe Russian walking down the street somewhere. Was this speech meant for him or her? Well, I think mo there were different parts of the speech. I think some parts of it were targeted at them. Quite large parts of it were targeted at the, the sort of business and political elites. Elites basically saying to them, you have nowhere left to go. So I mm -hmm. suggest you rediscover your patriotism um, and, and get on board because, you know, there's nowhere else for you anyway. And then also, I mean, particularly at the start, the bits around the war, they were clearly, um, there were sort of several audiences for those, in, including, um, including the, the West. When you listen to Vladimir Putin and you consider how bad um, Russian-U.S. relations are at the moment, I mean, you could come to the conclusion that um, as long as Vladimir Putin is in power, there will be uh, no reset from the West, reset in the West, no reconciliation, no attempt to bring Russia back into the European house, as Putin said right here in Berlin 20 years ago. I mean, is that your sense? That is my sense, and I really don't see how there could be, after a speech like today, any sort of sensible or rational rational attempt at a reset um, or at, at bringing Russia back into that common European home to which Russia does belong, you know, as, as much as any other European country. Um, but for obvious reasons, nobody particularly wants to share a home with Russia right now. Um, and I think one of the reasons is clear from the speech. He's, he's talking about, um, you know, the recognition um, of the four um, regions of Ukraine that, that, that were sort of annexed um, in, in, well, that he said were annexed in, in 2022. You know, cities of some of them, he's ne the Russian army have never occupied. This was a speech of a man digging in their hills and telling foreign audiences, but also domestic audiences, and especially the business elites, to be prepared um, to put up with this for quite a while longer. Let me ask you about what we heard from U.S. President Joe Biden today. He pointed the finger directly at Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. holding him responsible for what he said are numerous atrocities that have been committed in Ukraine. Um, what impact, if any, do accusations like this have on Vladimir Putin, do you think? I think they have absolutely no impact on him at all. I mean, the way of thinking in Russian politics more generally among the elites and, and maybe among sort of the, the less elite um, is that is, is brutally realist in the sense that they think, well, you know, what about Abu Ghraib? What about all of the atrocities that you've got up to around the world? What about the bombing of of Yugoslavia, you know, fine, maybe we do atrocities, but at least we're not hypocrites about it. You're even worse. You do all the same things as us, but you're hypocrites. I mean, that's, that's I'm not saying that's a fair view, but I mean, maybe it's, maybe it isn't, but that, that is the view that you would hear, um, I think, if you if you asked sort of Russian political elites about that. It could even backfire as well in terms of domestic audiences. I've certainly found, even when speaking to people who don't really approve of the war, um, that they react quite badly to suggestions of sort of that Russian soldiers have been committing um, have been committing war crimes. They say, well, you know, that's totally unbelievable. And if that's the, that you say that is one of the reasons why nobody believes the Western sources. Let me ask you about the role of China in all of this. I mean, this week we've got um, China's top diplomat in Moscow. We know that Russia and China announced that they, theirs is a friendship with no limits. That was last year, just before the start of the war. Did Putin, did, do you think, did he attempt today to maybe realign Russia, to put Russia and China on the same side as the global south in um, a struggle against the decadent West led by the U.S.? Did you see him trying to do that today? 
Yes, that's very astute analysis. And that's been something that he's been trying to do to different sort of measures for certain audiences. But today it was almost as if all of the narrative strands came together into more of a coherent whole. And this idea that Russia is fighting a defensive war, resisting cultural colonization of, of sort of what, what one might term Western or American normative imperialism. So the sense that Western values should be imposed on other countries with, with no regard for their sovereignty, um, as in, in the Kremlin's framing. Um, and in, in that sort of regard, the Kremlin is, is framing this war almost, you know, on this more symbolic sense as well. And of course, you know, as in Putin's phrase, the Ukrainian people are, are a hostage. Um, and so, again, this idea that actually they're freeing their brothers and sisters from, from this Western imperial force. And I have to ask you about nuclear weapons. What do you make of uh, Putin today suspending Russia's participation in the New START treaty? Um, he made it clear that Russia is not exiting this treaty. Yes, obviously very disappointing um, yeah, because it's very important um, for discussions around this in incredibly sensitive significant area to continue even if negotiations on resolving um, the, the, the war in Ukraine cannot or are sort of pretty pointless at the moment. Um, I think that most likely this is a way of sort of rattling the Western cage. Putin certainly believes that time is on his side um, and that he can wait this out. He has the patience and the West doesn't. The West will start to falter in his support for Ukraine. And he knows um, that the sort of threats about using nuclear weapons, the sort of underhand comments, that they work, that they frighten people, and as well they might, because, you know, nuclear annihilation, it's completely reasonable um, to, to be frightened about that. So my initial instinct um, is to interpret this within that sort of broader fear-mongering around the use of nuclear weapons um, as a means of sort of controlling or, or frightening Western audiences and telling them to back off Ukraine. Yeah, he certainly gets the world's attention when he throws the nuclear component into the equation with Ukraine, that is for sure. Jade McClinn, as always, we appreciate your time. Fascinating analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Well, earlier, I spoke with Yevgenia Kravchuk. She's a Ukrainian lawmaker from the governing servant of the People Party in Ukraine. And I asked her for her reaction to what both presidents said today. Uh Thank you for uh, first of all for inviting me to um, to this program. Uh, well, for me, it just means that Ukraine is on the right side of the history, together with the civilized world. That helps us because I think it's black and white. I mean, this uh, war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine is black and white. You can know, you know, see the great terms um, inside of it, and uh, of course, I mean, it, it, it was a historic. Um, moment when Joe Biden visited Kiev during the full-scale invasion of, of Russia. Just to remember, mm. uh, Russians uh, were saying that they will invade Kiev in three days. And uh, Joe Biden was walking together with President Zelensky in Mikhailovska Square. Uh, and just meters away, uh, there was um, this, you know, exhibition of ruined Russian tanks, mm. rusty uh, that were, you know, burnt in fire, you know, uh, yeah. uh, destroyed by Ukrainian troops. And uh, that is, you know, what's going on. And I, I talked to my friend who is in tank, uh, I'm sorry to say, it, <laughs> I want to finish, in, uh, they, they, he, he serves in uh, tank division. And he says, for us, it's only victory or victory. That's it. And the pickup on this notion of victory, we heard from the Russian President Vladimir Putin today. He doubled down on the lie that the U.S. and the West started the war in Ukraine. He also, um, he didn't show any signs that his military will be pulling back from the fighting. Um, what do you make of that? Uh, you know, I think that all of the normal countries, you know, civilized countries should think about what to do Ukraine to win, not thinking about what Putin says. I think it's essential because uh, we're still in this theory that, you know, how to save aggressors face or something. No, that's uh, very simple. Um, you know, uh, remember the Second World War and all of the history uh, lessons that were taught. You cannot please the aggressor. You just have to 
uh, to, you know, kick it out, you know, to punish it and uh, him and uh, just to bring justice to uh, to international order. That's it. So, uh, I mean, yes, they probably will mobilize more uh, Russians to go to the army, to go thousands of kilometers from their own home to mm -hmm. invade another country because i think this is clear it's not about you know ukrainians wanting part of russia no we don't you know help we don't need it yeah. you know yeah. we just want to live peacefully on our territory in our country and russians came and invaded that's the story and we want to kick them out and we have team coverage of today's two presidents two speeches our Brussels bureau chief, Alexander Phenomen, she is in Warsaw at the Royal Castle where U.S. President Biden gave his speech earlier today. And DW's Enos Pohl, she is covering it from Washington, D.C. Now, I spoke with him earlier and I began by asking Alexandra if President Biden's speech dispelled any doubts about U.S. resolve and support for Ukraine. Yes, I would say so. And I think this was uh, Biden's main message here, a message that uh, went down well with his Polish audience and with uh, Europeans in general, I would say. Uh, the U.S. president emphasized here that knowing what you stand for is important, but knowing who you are standing with makes all the difference. And he spoke about NATO and the U.S. commitment to NATO's Article 5, an article that states clearly that an attack against one ally is considered an attack against all allies. And that was, of course, what his Polish audience wanted to hear. And many people there at uh, the castle told me that uh, they were waiting for these words. And Enos, let me ask you um, how you see it from the other side of the Atlantic. What would you say was the biggest takeaway from Biden's speech today? Yeah, I agree with Alexandra here. Biden definitely wanted to send a clear message to the Polish people and to uh, Europe overall, but also to his fellow Americans. And Brent, I found it quite uh, strong how you could actually feel the pressure for him uh, within his own uh, kind of uh, American uh, group here. Why? Because as more and more of his fellow Americans are starting really to ask why the U.S. is spending so much money uh, in this faraway country. And therefore, we heard these really strong words like, for example, I quote this here, there's nothing less than freedom at stake. So this was a strong message also for home from abroad. And the U.S. president today, he also had some words, a message for the people of Russia. I want you to take a listen to part of what he said today. So tonight, I speak once more to the people of Russia. The United States and the nations of Europe do not seek to control or destroy Russia. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. President Putin chose this war. Every day the war continues is his choice. He could end the war with a word. It's simple. If Russia stopped invading Ukraine, it would end the war. If Ukraine stopped defending itself against Russia, it would be the end of Ukraine. Alexander, let me ask you, we know what the U.S. president is saying there. We hear his message. Um, do you think that most of the people in Russia, will they even, will they even get that message? Well, I doubt that they will really get uh, the message, uh, given the fact that all the media there is controlled by the Kremlin. However, I was not surprised that uh, uh, Joe Biden mentioned uh, uh, Vladimir Putin and directly addressed uh, the people of Russia, even though his team had told the press uh, before the speech that they didn't want it to, to turn into a back and forth with Putin. But of course, after Putin's speech, my impression was, was that uh, the U.S. president had to push back against Putin's narrative. He couldn't let it stand, this claim that NATO is to blame, that it wants to destroy Russia. And I think it was important for him to try to convey this message to the Russian people that this is not true, that Putin can't, could end the war immediately if he wanted to.
And Enos, before we go, let me ask you um, about how this continues with the U.S. president. We know yesterday he was in Kiev, today this speech, um, but there's still more business to be taken care of, isn't there? Right, so the two highlights are kind of over, but there is another important meeting, the so-called Bucharest uh, format that will take place tomorrow, where he meets with nine countries uh, from the eastern NATO flank, uh, Brent, and there is some expectation that he then finally will announce to send heavier weaponry to prevent the war to turn into a stalemate, because that was somewhat of a disappointment, not only in Kiev, but also today in Warsaw. Some, or actually many people in this part of the world, do hope uh, uh, that uh, the U.S. do send, for example, F-16 fighter jet and other heavier weaponry to Ukraine. DW's Edith Pohl in Washington and Alexander Phenomen in Warsaw. To both of you, thank you. Well, earlier I spoke with Elena Sokova. She's the executive director of the NGO Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. She explained what Russia's suspension of its participation in the New START treaty, what it means. Well, um, there have been precedents before about the suspension of treaty, uh, including by the U.S. Uh, previously. But one of the things uh, that probably Putin is trying to kind of weigh, this is one of the instruments where um, he understands the interest of the United States for it to be continued. What it means in practical terms is that uh, we're likely to see uh, less transparency about uh, the uh, what's going on in Russia with the strategic nuclear weapons and missiles. However, there has been a clarification from the Russian foreign ministry that Russia would still observe the limits established in the treaty, and it will also continue to notify about the launches of its um, intercontinental and sea-launched ballistic missiles, mm -hmm. which is a good news. Uh, what is not included um, in the kind of remaining parts is that uh, part of the treaty is a notification about the exercises mm -hmm. that each country does that involves these weapons. And that is a very um, uh, slippery slope. You yeah. countries could misread each other intentions. So that for me is probably the most important part of this suspension at the moment. We know that this treaty is scheduled to expire in 2026. I mean, what are the chances considering how relations, how frigid relations are right now? What would you say are the chances of um, the U.S. and Russia negotiating a new treaty? Well, first of all, I hope uh, the suspension is indeed suspension and they can go back to resuming uh, the implementation of it as uh, agreed. But um, negotiating any treaty is a very lengthy procedure. Um, when the US and Russia were negotiating the exactly the New START Treaty, uh, which was uh, ratified in 2010. It was a marathon of a year and a half almost to get it there. And the relationship between the two countries were much different. Mm -hmm. um, and it was building on the previous treaties. So anything new would be longer, difficult. But again, if we do see uh, a different change in, in the workforce and the relationship, Nothing is out of reach. But I'm very concerned about the even seeing that uh, treaty to survive until 2026. And, and also, if this treaty is allowed to expire, it will, in a way, take us back 50 years um, to a world where there were no limits on the, the warheads, these intercontinental ballistic missile warheads. I mean, are, are you concerned that that is going to be the case. We're going back in time, but we're also going to be adding China into the mix. We uh, will, if, if it does expire, or it even uh, Russia withdraws from the treaty before 2026, it will be the first time in, you're right, in almost 50 years where the two countries do not have a bilateral um, arms control treaty that focuses on its nu their nuclear arsenals, which is an unusual development given the history. 
Um, you're also correct that that probably, and Russia have actually been insisting on that for a while, that the next treaty should include China as well. But the prospects of that is uh, are unclear at the moment. Uh, China have been um, avoiding these discussions with the U.S. Mm. precisely for the reasons because its arsenal is much smaller than mm. that of the United States. Yeah. So it feels like it needs to build up first before yeah. sit down for the talks. Elena Sakova, we appreciate your time and your valuable insights tonight. Thank you. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is now urging Putin to reconsider. Stoltenberg met today with Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, and the European Union foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell. Their talks took place at NATO headquarters. At the same time, Russian President Vladimir Putin was giving his State of the Nation address in Moscow. Now, here is part of what Stoltenberg had to say earlier today. More nuclear weapons and uh, uh, less arms control makes the world more dangerous. And that's the reason why in NATO we have worked so hard uh, to um, engage Russia uh, on issues related to arms control and why NATO allies have supported the new start. Uh, and also why I'm calling on Russia uh, today to reconsider its uh, decision to suspend its participation in the new START agreement. We have to remember that this is uh, one of the last major arms control agreements we have uh, after uh, Russia started to violate the agreement that uh, uh, banned all the intermediate range uh, weapons, the INF Treaty, uh, that led to the demise of that uh, uh, treaty a few years ago. Uh, now they are su suspending the other big nuclear uh, arms control treaty, uh, the new start which regulates put limits on the total number of long range strategic uh, weapons. All right, I want to go now to our correspondent Terry Schultz. She is in Brussels covering this story for us tonight. It's good to see you, Terry. You know, this news of Putin suspending Russia's participation in the New START treaty. I mean, we've seen time and time again since this invasion of Ukraine began that when Putin injects nuclear weapons into the discussion, he immediately gets the world's attention. And that's what happened today at NATO, it appears. That's true. Although this isn't a total surprise, what Putin announced, because uh, the Russian side has been unwilling to continue negotiations about the extension of the New START treaty now for several months. And that's pretty unusual, because even when tensions have been really high between the two sides, typically on arms control, they managed to find a compromise. They've kept talking uh, throughout uh, years of bad relations between the U.S. and Russia. So this is really considered a bad sign. But in past weeks, both the U.S. and NATO as a whole have accused Russia of violating New START, which has, of course, led to the Russians not being willing to sit at a table with them. But, yeah, I think people are pretty alarmed, as this is the last major arms control treaty between the two sides. And we know that the focus of today's meeting in Brussels was actually European weapons, getting European weapons for Ukraine. What do we know so far? Tell us more. That's right. The situation is so dire for Ukraine right now, Brent, that we're seeing initiatives come in from everywhere. Today's meeting between uh, Stoltenberg and the EU High Representative Joseph Burrell and Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba was actually the first time a year into this war that all three of them have sat around a table and tried to figure out what role each could play in getting more deliveries to Ukraine. And what's particularly uh, pressing at this moment is ammunition. Ukraine warns that it may run out of ammunition. So we've, we've got a, a proposal on the table on the EU side from Estonia asking the EU to put 4 billion euros in a fund and then find ammunition for Ukraine from anywhere they can in the world. The numbers are, are really quite remarkable, Brent. Ukraine is shooting as many rounds per month as the entire European arms industry makes in a year when it wow. comes to rounds of ammunition. Wow. And you were able to ask some questions today at this um, press conference, right? 
That's right. That's right. I asked them what they're going to do about it. Uh, because, again, as I said, a year into this war, you would think that, that they would have taken some of these initiatives already because the lead time on producing ammunition and other equipment is so long. And these industries have been scaled back for years because, as we've said many times, nobody expected a shooting war in Europe ever again. So to expand the production line, which, which means stocking up on raw materials, sourcing them, hiring more people, training more people, People. That takes a long time, and the industry mm. has been warning uh, governments of this now for some time, that they need to put signed contracts on the table, money on the table, if they want to see the result in several months. Yeah, let's take a listen to, to, to what um, you were told today at this press conference. Not enough has been done, and this is why we're standing here. This is the statement of fact, and if you ask me on any issue, ha was enough done, right, uh, to provide you with everything you need? The answer is no. If, I, if we had already won the war and I would be standing here, I would have said the opposite. I would say, yes, we appreciate everything was done because we won the war. As long as this is not the case, it's not enough. In the beginning, we were actually depleting our own stocks. Uh, but uh, then we uh, saw that uh, the, the rate of consumption of, of ammunition uh, is much higher than the rate of production, and therefore this is not sustainable, therefore we need to, to produce more. But this is not something we discovered now. We discovered this many months ago, and therefore we have been engaged with the industry and with nations for a long time. And contracts have been signed. Uh, United States, France, Norway, among uh, others. Uh, but as, as uh, uh, Mr. Koleba said, uh, Dimitro said, uh, we, need, we need to speed up, uh, we need to do more, and that's exactly why we are meeting here. To provide the munitions to Ukraine through the European Peace Facility is nothing new. We have been doing that since the beginning of the war. Asking member states provide us with the uh, ammunition to be sent to Ukraine and being co-financed by the fund. So the only thing is to do it quicker at at a larger scale. All right, so Terry, after hearing all that, how dire then is the the equipment weapons shortfall? Well, let me unravel some of what we just heard there. Uh, it's dire, as I mentioned. There's, there are warnings that Ukraine simply cannot continue to fight at this level if it doesn't get more ammunition. And the European uh, weapons industry says, until you give us signed contracts, we can't produce more. Now, Secretary General Stoltenberg said there have been signed contracts, but I've been speaking to, to weapons manufacturers over the last week, Brent, in preparation for stories I'm doing for DW, and they tell us that even as they say this, they are not not delivering uh, contracts at the level they would need to really scale up ammunition. Now, what Vice, uh, what High Representative Burrell was talking about is this new proposal to put money into the EU and, and have them uh, make a, a, a joint procurement of a large nature that would convince industry it's worth it to scale up. There's enough confidence there that they will have long-term contracts, long-term benefits, that they're willing to do that. These are companies that need to make money. They can't be expected to, to speculate on what what might happen next, they want to have certainty. Our correspondent, Terry Schultz, with the latest from Brussels tonight on, yeah, getting the money for those weapons and getting the weapons for the Ukrainians. Terry, as always, thank you.